Makeley, and he is the uh, CEO and CTO and resident ad scientist at One Nanotechnology. And uh, there's a, a company you started, I believe, right? In Berkeley, California. In Berkeley. And um, he's going to speak on the aesthetics of anisotropy. Anisotropy. Thank you very much. Wow, it's uh, such a pleasure to be here tonight. And um, you know, a lot of times I'll, I'll lecture to chemistry audiences and material science audiences, and you know, I throw these lovely pictures up, and you know, we talk about various details. And I thought tonight um, we talk a little bit more about just you know, the the nature of it. You, know, you can see in the background for all these slides is material I'll talk about towards the end. Um, the central image that's moving is a 3D printer that can print all of the materials I'm going to show tonight. And the uh, movie on the left has absolutely nothing to do with what I'm going to talk to you tonight, but uh, it's kind of fun to look at. Um, I'm trying to figure out your clicker here. Yeah? Just the right there we go. one. There you go. Okay. So anisotropy. Um, it, it's, it's a lovely word. It just means uh, non-uniformity or, or that annoying characteristic of materials that you expect to be homogeneous and uniform and lovely have faults or defects or maybe even something even more useful than a fault or a defect, a, a feature. And most programmers will say it's not a, not a bug, it's a feature. And that's true to a certain extent. Um, this, optimal, maybe I should use my pointer that I, I brought specifically for this. Um, on the upper right, you see, hopefully the blue shows up on the camera. This is a transistor. Um, I deliberately obfuscated the size. Um, at one time, this was state of the art. And what you're seeing here are actually the little molecules of the material used to pattern the transistor. In that particular region, they really grab a hold of each other very tightly. And they do this because the plastics that that particular region are made out of have little components on them that are all the same lined up three or four in a row. This was very bad because the original batch that we got into the factory, I used to work for Intel Corporation, the original batch that we got didn't do this. And that's because the backbone of the plastic randomized the different components. And because an operator in Japan and a sub-sub supplier was trained to add all the ingredients together and stir, as opposed to add one and then the other, um, it caused that flaw. And this is an amazing flaw. This is, oh, I suppose that microgrid is around 15 nanometers. It's impossibly small, 15 one billionths of a meter. Your hair, if you cut it and look at the end of it, that's about 100 microns, so that's still way, way, way larger. This is the size of proteins. And today, the electronics that we're making is made largely on the size scale of many of the biological processes that make us live. Um, here's some interesting biological uh, entities, and they're definitely organized at extremely small scale. This is common chalk. So every time you use a piece of chalk, you're crushing up these absolutely gorgeous nanostructured machinery. Which one are you pointing at the one on the bottom? Yeah, the bottom right-hand okay. corner here. I'm sorry, my blue pointer is just not doing the job. Um, so. In this case, we went to a lot of effort to print these beautiful transistors. And at the time, they were. Today, our transistors are the size of the defect. But we went to all this trouble of you know, creating a material that we could print these arbitrary shapes with at the nanoscale. And the material itself says, ah, ah, ah. You know, I've got my own ordering principle. And that's exactly the way nature does this, is the materials themselves have a propensity to fit a certain way, to get a certain shape, to get a certain function. And these relationships between the various piece parts are encoded largely in shape and perhaps a little bit in the surface chemistry. And it allows very small, um, very complex patterns to spontaneously evolve. And you, know, the, you, you hear about nanotechnology all of the time. It's a, a coming thing. Soon we're going to have nanorobots everywhere. Well, I don't know about the nanorobots everywhere. I'm working on that on a different project. But what I can say is anybody that's worn a contact lens has worn nanotechnology. The, the lens needs to be able to move gases away and into the surface of the eye. And it's engineered with these very small pores. The little pores inside are small enough to let the gases through and keep the water behind. Mm -hmm. 
And the way they do it is there are two materials that, in this case, don't like each other very much, but they don't like each other in a very controlled way. And so as the contact lens here is being cast, the two materials segregate, and this, this minor component is sitting in its tiny little domain flushed out, and it makes essentially a sponge where the holes in the sponge are smaller than the light itself, and so it looks absolutely transparent. Um, OK, microelectronics. I come from a microelectronics background. Actually, I come from a drug design background before I did microelectronics. But we have to show some microelectronics. Here, I'm, I'm showing that the, the display, everybody's seen an LCD display. It turns out that the molecules are lined up just so before there's any electricity, the light can pass through. As soon as you put charge behind these very particular molecules, they're, fairly large and fairly flat, and they twist in an electric field, which changes the way polarized light goes through. If you've got a polarized lens on top of this display, wherever the electricity has bent those individual molecules around, you see the black because the light no longer can get through the polarizer. And the size scale of those molecular motions are on individual nanometer fractional nanometer, even though the collection of them is on a macro scale. Just like with the chalk, the business end of this system is very, very deep in the nanoscale, at least as far as the individual chemicals are concerned doing this. And this is, this is something that has fascinated me all my life, really, how molecules, how things larger than molecules can come together in ordered ways and how we can take advantage of this. In fact, I proposed when we came to the root of this that we take just a small fraction of the money that we saved by fixing that defect. And using it towards a research program. And that was very successful because we really can take, um, oops, we can take this tendency of materials that you want to be uniform to be non-uniform or this uncontrolled molecular anisotropy and we can harness this. Um, cells, of course, nature, as I've alluded to, is just exquisite at being able to harness these sort of relationships. And these yeast cells sitting here uh, maybe not the best picture, maybe not the worst, but it, it <coughs> illustrates that from at least a 400x point of view, where a light microscope does a good job, what you see in the cell is you know, amazingly simple. It looks like a uniform little spheroid. Maybe it's got a little dent in the side. Um, they're reasonably transparent because you can see when the edge goes over, there's a little lensing, but um, you know, it's kind of unremarkable, except, of course, these things can reproduce. So. Something's going on inside there that's really special. But to be able to say inside of there, there has to be an outside and inside and a way to distinguish that. And it turns out that nature has used particular fatty substances, fats, these phospholipids, that fit together. Now, they're very much like detergents, where a detergent will go into the water. It dissolves in the water, and it sits there with little tails that fish around looking for grease. And as soon as it finds the grease, the detergent will insert its little tail in a greasy spot and then solubilize it. In this case, when the side chains of these tails, these greasy protrusions, are very long, you don't tend to get a cleaning agent. Instead, you tend to get these you know, lovely membranes in the solution. You just mix, I've got some representative chemicals. The exact identity of this isopropanol will not be known. Um, you can take these larger molecules where there's a, a head that likes water, for instance, and there's a tail, a big, or maybe even two or three tails that do not like water. You've set up a situation where in one space we've got you know, a dynamic tension. And they'll spontaneously fold up instead of solubilizing the grease particle. Well, it solubilizes itself. Here's the outer part of the membrane with our head groups. And there's our little greasy tails all interdigitated. And then there's this little pocket inside that, you know, a little droplet of water in there. Well, that looks like a vehicle. In the case of our cells, it's a vehicle for life. It keeps the nasty outside world out and the wonderful, elegant little genetic chemistry in. This is a great place to do business. And in fact, our bodies are budding little guys like this off all the time, packed full of signal between our nerves. And we can create these artificial systems. You know, These look like nasty chemicals, but I guarantee any time you've used hand lotion or uh, Revlon shampoo, a couple of these guys, you've definitely smeared all over your body. In fact, you could eat both of those. This, this doesn't taste like much, but it's awfully like starch. And you can make a roux out of that. 
And that, in fact, <laughs> well, this is what we've done. Um, we've taken a couple of these materials. This is a little starchy cup. And so, you know, a starch would just sort of continue to fold out the spiral, but if you close the starch carefully on itself, and now people have done this on massive scales, you buy a bottle of it. It's exactly the right size to hold things like, oh, vitamin E, or, or maybe, maybe a, a chemical that you wanted to find. In fact, my business, in part, is designing and deploying chemical sensors, and we've had chemical sensors, all kinds of things. You, know, you, you might want to know where explosives are. You, you might want to know where the solvent's spilled. And so you need a way of uh, grabbing hold of chemicals very precisely, holding them still in places where you can operate on them. And so naturally, I have an interest in little cup-shaped things that can hold individual molecules and move them around. And in this combination, we've built our artificial cells to do just that. And here are some very tiny ones. These are micron, maybe a little submicron size. Not quite nano. Nano is usually maybe 10 times smaller than these guys. But certainly, the events going on inside these guys if we've put our little cup shapes inside them, they can move in and out of the membrane. And so it's sort of you know, an artificial cell with an artificial pore. And maybe if we put pressure on the material, we might squeeze the pores out more. And you can start imagining making functional materials where we've set up this lovely dynamic tension where the structures are just so under the conditions that you imagine. And as a sensor, I want to perturb those conditions. I want to destabilize the system. And I want to look for hopefully, dramatic changes in the system. And we find that there are all kinds of fun things that we can do, for instance, with little vesicles. Here is some yeast, you know, the yeast I showed you before. These are quite similar in size. Uh, I, I got to admit, nature's got the size di distribution thing down the path. These, these are kind of bigger ones and little ones. This looks more like pond water than beer. But uh, <laughs> you know, it, it makes the point that these guys have you know, interesting chemistry inside them. We've got a barrier on the outside. We've got some artificial pores tucked in them. They sit in a matrix that's different. And on a good day, they do what they're supposed to do. And that's all well and good, except cells are a lot more complicated than stupid little membranes that hold silicone jelly. Even though silicone jelly and little membranes are really useful, look at all this stuff that's going on in here. Here, the outer membrane are phospholipid bilayers in red. And you can get a suggestion even with some pores in there. Even some protrusions coming out, little pseudopoda. And then all this green stuff, all this beautiful green fibers twisting around. That's uh, a structural system, and it's also a communication system inside the cells. These little fibers are about 25 nanometers wide. And they're right now chaperoning the cell division. They're pulling the, the programming apart to make two cells. And it's these very, very uh, high surface area, very, very high complexity systems of self-organizing matter. I think it would be just lovely to put inside our, our, our sensors. Remember, I want lots of interaction. I want the ability for the outside and the inside to sort of sort themselves out, pick out trace quantities from the outside, get them together on the inside. And it seemed to me that fibers might be a good way to do it. And we started looking at materials that we could integrated into our sensors. Now, here's an idea of the kind of sensors we're talking about. These are the newer, smaller ones I used to work with. You know, if I were talking to you four years ago, I'd be saying, well, the size of my little fingernail is the smallest sensor we've got now, but we're headed towards these smaller ones. So these are the smaller ones now. And if I come back in three years, we'll need a microscope, because we're on track to do something even better than this. But for the sake of argument, we've got these. This is a zoom in. That's the business end of it. We've got these little metal fingers with space in between. And I'm going to stick my nano-organized, plasticky, cellular stuff in between the middle fingers. And when you know, evil chemistry, you know, uh, the, the terrorists' bomb-making materials, or you know, Joe's toluene that he's you know, glugging out into the reactor, or the aspirin that's in the process, or maybe the formaldehyde coming off the plastics, when that gets in to the material between the fingers, the little electrical signal in the fingers changes, and we detect that. And here we go. Here's a, well, this is right out of, you know, end of the world stuff. This is mustard gas, or at least it's a proxy for mustard gas. And we're able to detect it at 25 parts per million, which is good, because these are the sort of sensors that they use inside suits to make sure the suit's not leaking. We don't want those suits to leak. Not that stuff. The original sensors that I started to make, 
um, were built on a material like this, uh, uh, sort of halfway between a particle and halfway between a fiber. You get some sense that maybe the particles are all hollow, they start to cave in, but they've got all this room in between, and they're you know, reasonably stable. If you push really hard, you can flake them off, but you know they're stable to water, you can cook them at 400 degrees in the air and they brown up a little bit, but they're you know, pretty tough. And this was the basis of some of our earlier sensors. But we started to get interested in that, that, that porosity, the fact that the, the objects that we were putting down on the surface of the sensor could have structure inside them. So we've got these cell-sized droplets that we're, we're spraying with our machine. But I've got chemistry inside these guys that hollows the core out. These, these pores are quite small. You can see some suggestion of material being carried in between them. In fact, those little hairs you'll see later they are, it's a streaming material during the development process. If I lay this coating down, I cook it to sort of freeze it in place, and I wash away the stuff that I don't want to reveal the pores. And so you can see some suggestion of pores. That souffle crashed. These souffles didn't. And here the pore structure is absolutely obvious. Um, in this case, we use a little bit more of the pore and we change the solvent slightly. And then this became a very nice reproducible process. Here we've got very small. These are these are really uh, about 10 times smaller than our, our yeast cells, maybe 30 times smaller than our yeast cells. But we've got relatively reproducible pore sizes on the order of 50 to 100 nanometers. They're definitely smaller um, on some of the smaller objects. And that's exactly right, because to drive that separation process takes energy. And a tiny little droplet coming out of my tool, I didn't tell you anything about the process, but the tiny little droplet coming out of the tool is going to be losing solvent. And a bigger droplet loses more solvent, loses a function of surface area. So the smaller droplets dry out very quickly. There's not very much time for there to be much separation. And so these smaller droplets have smaller pores because they don't have as much time for the, for the chemicals to sort themselves out. And the larger droplets have a tendency to have larger pores. There are some small droplets with some really pretty pores. A friend of mine made a giant poster of this. He's the guy that made the sensors at Advanced MEMS. I make the coatings, and I'm very proud that this is his favorite picture. It hangs in his, his office. But, uh, I like this. As, I, I call these Osage oranges. If you've ever seen an Osage orange, it has a surface like that. And the particles are clearly fused together. And they've got these long extrusions, as I mentioned, as the layers are separating, as the two materials are separating. The one will get carried over with the other. And so we see these beautiful bridges. The thinness of that little tip is on the order of a, we're probably looking at you know, more or less like one or two molecules of sort of hanging off in space. And if we cook them um, colder, there's more, more time, but there's not enough energy. So if they're very cold, it's like spraying them quickly and evaporating. The pores don't develop. As we warm them up, we drive the separation process faster. The pores separate out better. Then we reach this cool threshold, or this warm threshold, where now these droplets that are coming down as they're coming down, they dry out completely. They don't, they don't mush into the surface like these guys did if they sit on top. And so we've got this cool transition going from fused to a liquid surface. We started playing with additives, and we started seeing these beautiful fibers showing up. This one little additive is there in a vanishingly small quantity. It's a detergent. And this particular detergent, like we had alluded to before, is chaperoning the material to try to grow this little fiber, not unlike the way the fibers form inside the cell. These fibers are being chaperoned by additives that hold their structure. You know, they're, they're really quite small. Um, you can see many of these have a suggestion that maybe two or three chains in parallel, and the chains are about five nanometers. Very, that's, um, that's smaller than the transistors that will be in your computer next year. What does that mean? Uh, a nanometer is uh, a billionth of a meter, so we're talking about objects the size of the proteins on your blood cells that the influenza virus grabs a hold of to infect. Uh, we're operating at the level of biochemistry, and these molecules are sorting themselves out. There, there is absolutely you know, no lithography, no printing. These guys are sorting themselves as a function of energy. And, um, we can cook this material a little bit longer, and we can see spontaneously these giant ribbons growing in these materials. It looks like it's weaving itself into a basket. 
And as far as I can tell, that's exactly what it's doing. We include nanoparticles in with that. That seems to corral the fibers. But now we've got basically hollow glass spheres being held together with these strong temperature and sensitive fibers. And we still have the little pores. How do I know this? Well, we cut it in half, and we see this just dramatic pore structure with larger channels leading to smaller channels, leading to the smallest pores, being reinforced and, to some degree, uh, being held together by the fiber structure. And this is exactly what you want, for instance, for a filter or for something to separate out proteins. It's got very high throughput, and this is the sensor material that I showed you in the beginning. Finally, um, we really can suppress most of that self-assembly. We tune for only the one size pore that we like. We use a pore forming material that grabs a hold of very tightly to the base of plastics. So the pores are really tight and really, really, really densely foamy in there. And this stuff is um, about 60% free space. And those pores, you can see the same material. They are um, the size of medium-sized proteins. The material is just spontaneously grows this all on its own. This is a different material. Uh, this is the last thing I'm going to show you. So we've done the porosity trick, but this material can be squeezed with an electric field. I know this because this exact sample was playing music in the laboratory. We hooked it up as a speaker and you could hear it, which means that now, in addition to being able to make these tiny little pores, we can squeeze the pores and make them bigger and smaller. So I hope that you've had a good um, entertainment watching these beautiful pictures. The, the guy who ran the SEM, the electron microscope, is Yasa Sanfono. He works uh, in uh, Arizona for Dr. Philipposian. Um, Mr. Ratner and Dr. McCormick are colleagues of mine here in San Francisco at Advanced Men's who do the electronic measurements. And I, I make the materials and the, and the dirty dishes. So thank you very much for listening to me tonight. Okay, that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, you said two things, and I'll say yes to both of them. There are surfaces now, and they're called superhydrophobic. In fact, uh, the first material I showed you too many slides. There. That stuff is actually an example of one of these. The surface has lots of little pokey points. And the very high surface area combined with the, well, small, you don't really see this with features larger than about a quarter of a micron, but once you get down around 100, 100 nanometers, these, what I mean is all of these little loops that are sticking out, they're thin enough and they're large enough, they're long enough, that they really increase the surface area and they suspend the water. So that's repellent. To get things to burn off, um, people have made shingles and thin coatings over windows of a substance called titanium dioxide. It takes in light. It, it excites an electron that makes it into like peroxide and greasy and uh, colored substances tend to be burned up by that. So there, there are two kinds of nano coating that are integrated together. And you basically use a process not unlike that, only you dope it with titanium dioxide and it makes a self-cleaning window. The ones I've seen are, are very translucent, but I think the transparent technology is definitely coming. Certainly for shingles, it's there. In the back. Yeah, I'll see if I can articulate the questions on a several different layer. One has to do with you're, you're developing technologies or methodologies to control on a nano level through natural forces. That's right. Okay. So to the extent that that's symmetrical to what happens in nature, currently in the field, what are the parameters of the restrictions? Or is it oh, wow, that's a great question. Person? So the, what are the, okay, so if we're talking about a purely biological natural system, the restrictions are generally, it's got to operate 
more or less at pH 7, neutral pH 9, not enough that you'd feel soapy on your fingers. You know, sort of, if you start feeling the soapiness, it, it means your cells are starting to be dissolved. So you've got to stay more or less in water, and you pretty much have to work with uh, you know, room temperature, not, not you know, like 0 to 100 degrees. So the, it's really limiting. But for you know, polymer design, that's one of the reasons why I sort of escaped from medicine and I went into polymers, because you know, the sky is the limit. You can really take the gloves well, off. Uh, uh, so let, let's say, use the word architectural yes. form constrictions. There's much more architectural latitude if you're creating an arbitrary shape. For the biological, uh, right-handed versus left-handed matters a lot. So the architectural attention to detail um, is maybe 10 times more complex for most biological systems versus you know, a, a plastic material like this. Uh, it has its complexity, and we're certainly making them more complex. But I would say that for structural or engineering materials, they have a lot more latitude. I'm sorry, I may have gone way over. Oh, no, no, you're good. You're good. Okay. Are there any other questions out there? I have a question, but I'll let somebody else ask a question. That effect is um, how a lotus leaf um, shed water. That effect on the screen is how lotus. a lotus, lotus leaf effect water. That's, exa that's exactly What are these coated with to take pictures of them with? I'm sorry? What are they coated with to take an electron microscope picture with? Well, you know, we, 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 f we fiddled a lot. Um, that's a good question, too. It turns out that the electron microscope is you know, taking, essentially, a kind of hard radiation, blasting the surface as plastic. Um, <coughs> you probably notice that in some of these cases, you can see right through some of the features. The electrons, don't, they're not stopped by soft stuff like us or plastics. And so we, we typically coat it with uh, gold palladium alloy. But not very much. Uh, it's really important to get the fine features. You, if you're actually doing this, you just, just kiss it with a gold palladium. That's what uh, Dr. Sampurno, uh, he and I went back and forth. We tried uncoated. We've tried it a lot. I've tried it a lot in my career. Uncoated just never works. Everybody says, oh, yeah, we'll keep the energy low. Uh-uh. But just, just a whisper of gold palladium makes all the difference. Can I ask you a, a really general question? Sure. So, so I understood you made sensors. Yes. But I didn't catch what the other application Oh, so I to yeah. Understand exactly what no, no, like thank you. you yeah. like thank you very much. That's that's something I really should talk more about. So, um, in general, um, you know, I, I alluded to, for instance, you know, the, the pores the size of proteins. Well, if you imagine, um, you know, a long strip of this stuff, and you sort of pour a mixture of proteins over it, the proteins that fit into the nooks and crannies will sort of spend a lot more time there and they'll slow down. The proteins that are kind of big, they just sort of fall over the surface. So certainly separation, the, the materials that separate out smaller molecules from larger molecules, proteins from other bio, biopolymers would certainly be a really good candidate for this because we can control the chemistry inside and outside. Um, obviously sensors, um, this particular material is a pretty good insulator. So it has aerospace applications in um, insulating electronics, like for instance, uh, infrared sensing squids. Um, the other application that I know for this that um, mm -hmm. was kind of how, how I funded this is in the computer industry, they need to separate sometimes very, 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 very close together metal lines that have signal and you don't want the signal to cross them. You have to fill it with something. Air is better than almost anything, but you don't get any strength from air. Glass is great, but it doesn't work anymore. It was great for two micron technology. But small. So these, these very foamy materials we were using for low K dielectric. And the last stuff, the really, really tiny stuff, that is world class low K ILD. It has a dielectric constant of 1.9, which is you know, at one point when I was at Intel, I was to die for. Now anybody, you know, you, you sort of look under any rock and you find people doing that. But um, the coolest application, I think, is you've probably noticed all these, these are ways to be very textured in very different ways. Tissue in the body, to some degree, is organized on the basis of its shape and environment. People have shown that culturing various kinds of cells on different kinds of nanostructures, I mean, the cells will sometimes grow in different ways, and sometimes they even express different genes. So what I would very much like to work on for the, these materials, and I have a grant proposal that I'm writing, should be writing it right now, is using this as a flexible layer for implants so that we can cozy this material up with maybe wires inside it, but it's textured with the surface so that the cells not only can sit on the surface and feel comfortable, but they can grow and interdigitate into the material 
to make a, a, a stronger, more robust system so that when the electrode is sitting there actually in a living brain, it's not damaging the brain. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll take a break for about 10 minutes. Between, of course, and then we'll gather back together in about 10 minutes or so.